Hello and welcome back to another of my episodes of PS Crafty DIY. Today I'd like to show you my new bandsaw, which is a Shepa HBS 261. I bought mine from Screwfix while on offer for 230 quid. However, I think this saw is exactly the same as the one sold in Aldi for only 149.99 under their own brand called Ferex. The specs for both are identical, and the only difference is the color and the branding. With the Shepa, you get two years warranty, and with the Ferex, you get whopping three years. Unfortunately, when I was looking, the Ferex was not available, so I had to splash the hard and cash on the one with the pretty Shepa sticker. So why did I choose this saw over the rest currently on the market for similar price? Well, it's got a decent sized solid cast aluminum table, not a tiny little dinky one. The cutting height capacity is up to 120mm and it's got 550W motor, which can only be seen on band saws in a different price range really. So what do we get in a box? Spare blade, a fence, a mitre gauge, a push stick, a couple of tools and screws for assembly, plastic knob for setting a tension, dust board, a manual, table extension, a cast aluminum table, and the machine itself of course. Right, let's throw it together, set it up and see what we get. I'll make a start by moving the blade guard all the way up for better access. New blade has already been installed in the factory. Next step is to install the table, so I have to remove this ratchet handle and the washer first. Quick tip, keep your finger on the fixing bolt pushing it all the way to the edge of the slot, as the bolt might fall inside the casting and you might have a trouble getting it out. Now carefully flip the table up. Thread the bandsaw blade through the slot and align the guide rails with the bracket on the saw, while guiding the bolt through the hole with your fingers. Right, so after thorough inspection from my top advisor, I finally get the OK to fit the washer and the ratchet handle back on. Now this can be a bit tricky since there is not enough room to rotate the handle. But apparently the ratchet handle is spring-loaded, so if I use one hand to pull the handle down and the other hand to rotate the barrel, I can get that fitted quite easily. Well, thanks for that tip, Millie. Now I need to clamp the table together by fitting the provided hex bolt, nut and a washer. This should level it up as well, as at the moment it does not seem to be straight at all. The spanner included in the kit is a bit useless as it won't fit in the slot. You need a ring spanner or a socket for this really. Keep checking the table with straight edge while tightening the screw until the table is level. If you do this wrong, you might not be able to fit the table extension and your cut won't be square. It's something they don't tell you in the manual. Once the table is level, it's time to fit the table extension. These two screws are acting as stops, so they need to come out for a bit. Well, it looks like it's all greased up for smooth operation, so I can go ahead and slide that on. Refit the end stop screws back in and test it out, of course. Slide the table extension out and check the operation of the locking lever. Alright, let's fit the dust board on using the four screws provided. And slip on the tensioning handle on the top. When you turn it round, it will locate itself in the shaft. Next up is the fence. I like to see that it's clamping on the table securely from both sides. And the clamping pressure can be adjusted to suit with this little thumb wheel. Nice touch that. Now I can pop the mitre gauge on and the push stick. There we go, Shepa HBS261 in a full glory. Ok, let's set it up then. Safety first, make sure the supply cable is disconnected from the mains. I'll open both guards and begin with setting the blade tracking and tension. When tracking, always make sure that the blade is sat on the ground of the wheel with the deepest part of the gullet in the centre. To do this, you first need to apply some tension to the blade with the handle at the top. Then spin the top wheel in the blade cutting direction with your hand while turning the tracking control handle at the back. Watch which way the blade is moving and keep adjusting tracking accordingly until the blade is in the correct position and stays there. Next step is to set the blade tension. 
This is usually checked inside the saw. Simply push the blade towards the spine of the saw, applying a moderate pressure. The blade should deflect by approximately 6 mm or one quarter of an inch. Once happy, always check the tracking again, as moving the wheels up or down to get the right tension can cause the blade to move. All looks good, so I can lock it off and move on to setting the guides. A bandsaw will only cut accurately if the blade guides are set correctly, so these are quite important. You might have to drop the table off for better access and loosen the guide brackets so you can move them easily where they need to be. First we need to set the side guide front to back adjustment. The front edge of the bearing needs to be sat just behind the deepest part of the gullet on the blade. Just about 1.5mm behind the gullet or 1 16th of an inch. If the bearing sits inside the gullet, it's going to flatten the teeth out and form a knife edge. That's something we try to avoid. So now we've got this set at the top, We'll do the exact same thing at the bottom. Next step is to set the thrust bearings on the top and the bottom. These are supporting the blade from the back and should be positioned just behind the blade, but never in contact with it. If you get it too far forward, it's going to tweak the blade just enough to cause it to drift. So the best way to do this is to bring the bearing in whilst rotating the wheel until it comes in contact with the blade, then back it off slightly. These are quite important, so take time to set them just right. Right, let's come back to the side guides for a bit. These are set similarly. Bring them in towards the side of the blade, so they come in contact, then back them off slightly, so they are not touching the blade while it rotates round. The side guides are there to stop the back edge of the blade fishtailing. If you get any of the bearings rubbing against the blade, you're gonna destroy them very quickly. They need to be just a hairline away from it. Now all guides are set, we can ensure the table is perpendicular to the blade, so our cut will be at 90 degrees angle too. This is done with the set square or digital angle finder, and the adjustment can be made with a bolt underneath the table. There we go, that looks pretty square to me. We can verify the squareness by making a test cut. Considering both sides of the woods that we are using are parallel to each other, we can make a cut. Then flip the wood over, Bring it around back and check if the blade fits perfectly back into the cut. If it does, we know the table is square to the blade across the whole surface. Right, we can now set the pointer on the scale to indicate 0 degrees. Next step is to align the fence with the mitre slot. Simply bring your fence to the mitre slot edge and check if it runs parallel with it. Or you can find yourself a board with the machine flat surface that fits right into the slot and then align the fence with a straight board. The fence adjustment can be made using the two screws on the top. So just loosen them off, bring the fence to the face of the board, align it and tighten them back up. Don't go overboard with these, so you don't strip the threads. Some people align the fence with the blade though, not with the mitre gauge. They place a straight edge flat on the table, lining it up with the body of the blade, in between the teeth as these are offset from the blade. Then align the fence to the straight edge. Now this should work perfectly fine for making straight cuts, but I found it inaccurate. More importantly, Using this method, your blade might be parallel with your fence, but it definitely won't be parallel with your mitre slot, making the mitre slot with the mitre gate completely useless for mitre cuts. So let's align the fence with the mitre slot, and then align the whole table to the blade. That way the fence and the mitre slot will be parallel to the blade. This adjustment can be made by slacking off these four bolts underneath the table. These are fixing the table to the trunnion, but provide enough movement for us to set the table parallel to the blade. Now there is a couple of methods for doing this. You can use your mitre gauge and a set square. Ensure the mitre gauge is set to 90 degrees. Tighten in place and at this point you can set your pointer to indicate 90 degrees if you like. Slide your mitre gauge into the mitre slot and place your set square into the mitre gauge so it is in contact with the blade. Slowly slide the mitre gauge forward and watch if the set square runs parallel with the blade. If the set square runs into the blade, your table needs to be shifted anti-clockwise. And if the set square runs away from the blade, your table needs to be shifted clockwise. So have a little play. And what if you haven't got a mitre gauge? Well, the following method should work for you. You'll need a board that you know is perfectly square, and you'll need your fence that has already been aligned with the mitre slot. Using your set square, draw a couple of lines on the board. Set your fence so the blade is on your first line, and make a test cut. 
Watch if the blade cuts along your line precisely or if it starts to drift away from it. If it drifts away from the line, shift your table in an appropriate direction to compensate for the drift. I found it a bit difficult using the original blade, as it was all over the place, but once I swapped for a proper blade, it was fairly easy. So let's see how accurate we really are. 28.68 on one end and 28.64 on the other. Well, I think I can live with that, so let's tighten the fixing bolt and set the pointer on our fence to indicate zero, once the fence is in contact with the teeth on the blade. And that's it, we are all set. So let's see how this budget saw performs. First I'd like to show you the supplied blade. Its width is 10mm or 3.8 and it's a 6 dpi. First up is this melamine coated chipboard. Well, the cut appears to be fairly clean and reasonably straight. But feed it with something thicker and the blade starts to drift. This can ruin your day really. So, I bought a set of good quality blades and had to go again. This is a half inch 4 TPI blade. Let's see how it goes. Not bad. Not bad at all. What about resawing this African Iroko? 120mm high. This is the maximum throat capacity of the saw. Let's try. Just need to feed it slow. Well, would you look at that? Yeah, I know what you're gonna say. You can't compare a half inch blade with a 3 8 on a straight cut, eh? Well, of course not. So I've set up the saw with a blade a lot smaller. This is a 316.6 TPI blade, and it's actually slightly smaller to what the manufacturer recommends running in this saw. 25.34 and 25.38. Let's try the thicker stock. Will it cut straight? Yes it does, and it looks like there is plenty of support from the bearings to run blade even this thin. Ok, while I've got this blade installed, let's try cutting those intricate cuts. I'm sure most of you are looking to get a bandsaw to do just that. Alright, that seems to be working well. In fact, so well, I managed to make my first ever two bandsaw boxes on this saw. If you are interested to see how I made those bandsaw boxes, please subscribe and hit that notification bell, as videos for both builds are coming soon. So what else have I got to report to you about this saw? Let's start with the positives. The table is solid and together with the table extension, it supports larger pieces well. The fence locks on securely and so far it has not moved on me. The bandsaw comes with two speeds, so if you want to cut that tricky material, or if you are just learning, you can slow the blade down on these two pulleys. As for the safety, it's pretty standard. The saw is equipped with two guard switches, and it can be bolted down onto a workbench or a stand. And now with the negatives. The mitre gauge has excessive play in the mitre slot, making it absolutely useless as it will not maintain the set angle during the cut. How on earth, in the 21st century, when we have a CNC machine capable of tolerances as tight as few microns, we get a slot like that? If anyone from Shepa is watching, please drop me a line, as our grandfathers were able to do a better job with a set of calipers on a mill operated manually. Luckily there is a solution. If you use a double-sided tape and stick a piece of plastic strip onto the side of the mitre gauge runner, it will close the gap and the mitre gauge then actually performs fine. You shouldn't have to do this really, but it is what it is. Just find yourself something that fits in there nice and snug. The blade tensioning mechanism looks a bit fragile, but if kept clean and lubricated, it might last. Only the time will tell. And some of the finishes on the saw are a bit tutty. Would I recommend it? Well, I would say it's a decent budget saw reasonably made, although there is room for improvement. There is enough blade support and plenty of adjustment to tune it off, so with a good blade it cuts accurately. It's definitely a good start for a weekend warrior like myself, and if you can get it for 150 quid from Aldi with 3 years warranty, grab yourself a bargain. Thank you all for watching, and if you have enjoyed this video, or if you found it helpful, please like, share or subscribe, as it will help me create more content for you.